have uh, the first plenary session. We have four speakers, from two of them from Nigeria and two of them from South Africa. So it is an African session. Most welcome for our brothers and colleagues from Africa. Uh, the first presentation will be <coughs> about the environmental toxins and infertility. It is will delivered by uh, Dr. Oladabo Ashiro from Nigeria. He is uh, uh, chief medical director of the MART Group of Health Service Institute of Reproductive Medicine consisting of the Medical ART Assisted Reproductive Technology Center, the MART Diagnostic Center, the MART Medicare for High Risk Obstetrics and Neonatal Care, and the MART Live Detox Clinic, the first modern Meyer Clinic in Africa. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Aldabo will uh, deliver his lecture virtually. Uh, he, he, is the professor is with us online or is a recorded recorded presentation? Okay, you can start, please. I'll be talking today on the effect of environmental toxins on infertility at the Egyptian Federation of Fertility and Serility Society conference in Cairo, December 1 to 2, 2020. I'm Professor Lada Ashiru, Secretary General of the International Federation of Fertility Society, and also all other aspects so described. When you talk about environmental toxins, we want to look at the environmental toxins in Africa. I've also been talking about endocrine destruction chemicals and their effect on reproductive health, minimizing effect of endocrine, endocrine destructing chemicals with more than mere medicine type of detoxification, and then I'll make my conclusions. In terms of Africa and the environmental toxins, what are these environmental toxins? What are the factors responsible for reproductive health issues, aging and disease with regards to this, and the root of exposure of toxins? And I will also talk about the toxins from the African oil industries. Environmental chemicals or toxins are compounds or elements in the air, water, food, soil, dust, or other environmental media such as consumer products. Human samples like urine, blood, serum, breast milk, and meconium contain more than 300 environmental chemicals as well from the CDC report of 2021. Now, when you look at this, you will see that a lot of publications have been done and reviewed on environmental toxins and infertility. This was Integrated Med Medicine Clinical Journal. And this also shows that you can find high level of mercury in men with abnormal sperm indices and in women with environmental, uh, with um, unexplained infertility. This also was uh, the impact of heavy metals has also been reported on female reproductive system. Those heavy metals include mercury, arsenic, antimony, lead, and others. So also have they reported the toxic effect of the cyanobacteria, which is a growing threat to water and air quality. The, it is also shown that you can optimize fertility by uh, reducing exposure to common substances like alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, caffeine, plastic, for example, before conception. And this was also endorsed by the uh, International Grocery as by the consortium 
at WHO, which was published in 2017. The factors responsible for this, they have large fish which contains mercury and so also is stock fish. They are very toxic to the reproductive system. Also, I will talk about food like pastries. This has a lot of lactose intolerance for Africans because 90% of Africans are lactose intolerant. So these pastries can have uh, lower their fertility index. Same the environmental toxins are present in rice that are not properly boiled. They contain arsenic. And so we advise that people should boil the rice, at least rinse it twice before cooking it. Raw vegetables are also exposed to fertilizers and arsenic from the soil. And so uh, proper cleaning will reduce exposure to this product. This is important. Most women who drive barefooted, we found out that the padding of these accelerators, of these driving pedals, they contain antimony. And therefore, if you drive barefooted, you can absorb antimony, which is also been shown to be embryotoxic. These are all the various aspects that um, you can get this uh, pollution from, water, air, even light, noise, and heat. And these are all effects on our body system. The various routes of exposure to toxicants are as follows. You can have from fumigation for pesticides in the farm. You can also have uh, crops exposure to these pesticides and heavy metals. And persistent organic pollutant DDT and PCB are used. Women cosmetics, they have phthalates, which are very uh, dangerous to the reproductive system. For example, a woman is supposed to use one ton of lipstick in her lifetime, so that is dangerous. Bisphenol A in tin foods and bottle products that are exposed to the air or heat. Also, all the various types include the, uh, the ozone uh, pollution from uh, industries, uh, heavy car buildup, emitting diesels and petrochemicals, aviation fuel, and also smoking. These are just some of these. Now we'll go and talk about the oil producing countries in Africa. There are 10 of them, and you can see them displayed here, starting from Nigeria, Algeria, Angola, Libya, Egypt, and others. Now, these oil producing countries have oil that are money that is wealth that is created but equally created are the environmental toxins from this i will give the example of nigeria to show you how this happens africa's biggest oil producer is nigeria 2.5 million barrels per day almost all of the country's reserve are located in the delta of the niger river Currently has over 150 oil fields and over 1,400 active wells. Now see what happens with this world. This is the map of Nigeria. The area painted in yellow are the areas which are the Niger Delta state producing the oil region. And these oil producing process are prone, they are, they are manufactured by these various companies like Ajib, Start Oil, National ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron. But the consequences is that they have oil spills that come in the coastal waters of Ogoni community because of the oil, the oil fields in these areas in River Nigeria. And this area affects their fishing and other uh, aquarian uh, agriculture. So these are some of the problems that we face in this area. And even workers or people who live in this area talk about the problem of soot that comes from the refineries, from the gas piping, 
gas burning. So uh, when they go out of their house, by the time they come back, uh, they have soot on their on their tables. What are the effects of this on health? What are the effects on reproduction? What is the mechanism and the epigenetics that is involved? Uh, let me quickly go through this. These are the various target organs that are affected by the endocrine disease, the disease. Starting from the pineal gland, the brain, hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, all the way to the uterus, testes, ovaries, they are all affected. No organ is spared, including the adrenal. And it is now known that endocrine disorder chemicals has implications for human health. Some of the problems that we have, they include child and adult obesity, impaired glucose tolerance tests, gestational diabetes, uh, polycystic ovarian disease, reduced palm quality, endometriosis, and so on and so forth. Consequently, it is said that there is no one, even though the, the, there is still systematic evaluation of all the evidences, there is growing evidence supports an action to reduce exposure to these endocrine destructing chemicals in the environment to improve fertility. The effects of these chemicals, they range from physical to chemical and even biological forms. And when you look at this, many are not at the level toxic enough to warrant acute presentations per time. However, they are salient enough to affect the normal physiological functions over a period and also reduce reproduction. Other effects, a difficulty in conception. We, try, we have a lot of patients who have problem in conceiving. By the time you go and evaluate them, you find out that they have a lot of heavy metals and other toxins, especially aviation fuel in them. Miscarriage, abnormal babies, and we know that pesticide, for example, can affect three generations in a row. It will affect the mother. It will affect the the, the fetus in that mother and it will affect the baby to be born by that fetus. So that is why care has to be taken. These endocrine disrupting chemicals also have effects on general health. The effects include um, infertility in both sexes, a major cause of reduced work output, and also Naturally occurring radioactive materials like radium, they are encountered in oil exploration. They might cause bone and other forms of cancer. So this is a clear and present danger. The mechanism that the reproductive system, the toxins occur, is a toxin from the oil industry, as reported by one of my graduate students in 2013 that toxins from the oil industries are capable of mimicking the actions of reproductive hormones and have the ability to disrupt the neuroendocrine system or the functions of the gonads directly. So when you are exposed to most of these toxins, either oral inhalation of the skin, it will add, interact with the hormone system, alter the hormone system, and then it will disrupt the molecular pathway and end up in dysfunctional reproductive cells and reproductive impairment. Next is that a lot of studies have been done in the experimental animal where it was shown that this crude oil, for example, especially to bony light crude oil in Nigeria can cause a reduction in toxicular uh, morphology and weight and cause infertility. Also, the other works have been done in uh, other animals, like uh, other studies, which have all confirmed that ingestion or exposure to this can affect sperm motility and morphology. These are done 
in Nigeria. Mechanism of the line, the effects of uh, endocrine uh, distorting chemicals. It's shown that there are different pathways that these chemicals can take. I will just go over this. We can go through the aryl hydrocarbon receptor or the estrogen receptor or the rapid response involving membrane associated receptors. Altogether, this pathway is a nuclear translocator binding to the dioxin receptors in the element or the estrogen receptors binding to the estrogen receptors in the element and also the non-genomic pathway, which is the kinase signaling ca cascade. Furthermore, uh, the epigenetic pathways is that the environmental exposures can go through genetic pathways or the epigenetic pathways. The path A, B, path C, and D. And at the end of the day, they all have susceptibility highly and low for path A, highly persistent for path B, and high or low susceptibility for path C, and reversible for path D and altogether causing transmitted transgenerational, transgenerationally and the health effects are manifested. This was work from Bolti, Bulati. Now having talked about these environmental toxins and having underscored their importance, it is now important to say what do we do about it? So we must minimize the effect of these endocrine destructors and there are several ways that can be done but in Nigeria in the last 10 years we have been using this model of mayor, modern mayor medicine type of detoxification to remove these toxins and this was a process that started very early by a pioneer mayor physician Dr. Frank Zevermeer he was born in 1875 in Austria, but went through medical school in Graz and finished with honor summa cum laude in 1901. But he started to practice his uh, Maya medicine in Vienna in 1939. And by the end of the day, uh, he had established a modern Maya medicine type of detoxification in Austria, where we also went to collaborate and also bring this process to Nigeria, being the first in Africa. What does it mean? Modern Maya Medicine, MMM, is the toxification that refers to the different processes by which toxic substances are eliminated from the body and a thorough intestinal cleansing is achieved for a healthy digestive system. So the emphasis of the first principles of Maya was to thoroughly clean the intestinal system. And it is now shown, it's been shown by this review in Fatigue and Sanity that the emerging role of gut microbiomes in polycystic ovarian disease syndrome, that gut microbiomes in patients with PCO is significantly affected by factors such as obesity, androgens, insulin resistance, and age. Therefore, Maya therapy can help mitigate the influence of the gut biome and therefore providing an alternative management to PCO, polycystic ovarian disease syndrome. Uh, this is the uh, mechanism showing this uh, emerging role of uh, gut microbiomes in polycystic ovarian syndrome. How, for example, food gets into the lining of the gut and you have the unconjugated by acids, you have some bacteria, and you also have gram negative bacteria. All these, they enter, they, they, they work on fermentation on the gut lining, and they enable these toxins to go through the uh, mucosa, and by so doing, they will translate and bring uh, substances into the fat cells, the ovary, the hypothalamus, as well as the immune system. This will be the altering pathway that triggers polycystic ovarian disease. 
Now, you, you can do more on that if you want, but uh, mother mere therapy is a detoxification relatively new approach to prevent medicine, to preventive medicine. It's very new. It has gained widespread acceptance in Europe, especially in um, most of the Austria and other parts of Europe. And then also, also, uh, mayor therapy's effectiveness is driving down the cost of curative medicine once identifiable and has been recognized. We have done a lot of work on this and we published this. This is managing environmental exposures in clinical in clinical practice by Mayor Medicine. Uh, this was published in Global Reproductive Health and um, where we showed that in patients going through in vitro fertilization, uh, elimination, major detoxification was able to help them to improve the pregnancy rate substantially. And this shows how this 131 patient in group A who went through uh, MIA therapy uh, and group B on and the others with donor egg now end up with um, a significant improvement in all the parameters from uh, positive beta ECG to 54% to also in terms of uh, live birth and ongoing pregnancy. So we had almost a 10 to 20% increase in performance uh, success rate. We have also shown that we can successfully remove heavy metals from the environment by this murder mirror medicine, and we're able to measure it quantitatively by taking a patient sample, as a, a patient A, that we took blood uh, urine samples to measure the amount of um, uh, amount of urine, heavy metals in its urine, and after we got the patient to give the urine for us in October, he went through wear therapy in the whole of November. And if you could see that the, the, uh, the Geneva Diagnostic Test in September 2021 that showed a lot of heavy metal was confirmed on arrival in Nigeria in March, in October 2021. And he now went through mere detoxification to remove these heavy metals. And by the time the test was repeated, in Genova Diagnostic in the US in November 2021, the heavy metal that showed up in September had now decreased significantly by the detoxification that he went through in October through November. And the metal toxic effect revealed significant high values of copper, manganese, vanadium, and rubidium. And this, when they were repeated, it showed that they were now gone. This was how this was the first test in October. You can see how this uh, level showing toxic level of these substances. This is Genova Diagnostics, and you could also see the same here. The following month, uh, two, three months later after the toxication, you can now see that the levels are now low and normal. And this was confirmed by the same Assyria test. So we therefore conclude that this method using bioenergetic test, which is a non-invasive method, is a very good way to use for um, patients going through IVF since it's not invasive and it's cheaper than the urine test and it is almost, uh, it takes, the result is immediate as opposed to having to wait for your urine analysis to come back. But this thing needs to be done on a randomized, on a large studies. Therefore, I want to say that therefore, at Mark Lab Detox Clinic in Lagos, Maya detoxification is flagged off with a bioenergetic test, which helps to determine the degree of deviation from ideal physiology with different organ systems. And then the prescribed common therapies are oxygen treatment, hypoxicator and saline oxygenation, chelating treatment with heavy metals, electrolysis, chlorella, selenium, 
um, filanto calcium bicarbonate and also we now use infusion of metacarbonate bentonate to remove the uh, heavy metals and we also do lymphatic drainage and these uh, some of the typical battery of uh, equipment we use apocicator to bring in oxygen at high level saline oxygenation which is a very good antioxidant electrolysis food detox to remove then lymphatic drainage from the body and we also have the infrared cabin to improve circulation as well as uh, hydrotherapy bath so the possible role of uh, heavy metals have been done we can remove them through a uh, mere nitrification it improves every, it removes the metal also antioxidant automolecular supplement so it's a whole group of this entity working together to help to solve uh, humanity thank you very much our uh, environment consists of large toxins and edc can our persistence are present and mere therapy can be helpful in doing this and these are the areas that have helped these are the members of our team these are the references i conclude by saying that i recognize this stuff in my kind other than goodness thank you very much global problem of the uh, toxicity and for suggesting uh, a, a treatment this is a very important topic actually uh, Dr. Ashiro is with us online can you hear us? Dr. Ashiro said yes <laughs> where he muted <laughs> dr ashiro we cannot hear you can you You are with us. Can you hear us? Okay. Any questions from the floor? Dr. Shalani, please. Actually, uh, Amr Shalafani from Amin Shams University in Cairo. Uh, my simple question actually do we have evidence that these interventions we are doing are actually doing the main job, job of, of reducing, reducing the reproductive, reproductive consequences that we are talking about? Thank you. at day three and they didn't get pregnant and when we then took them through uh, uh, the test in Maya which we have now verified using a Genova uh, diagnostics in the United States uh, which measures uh, um, endocrine uh, the toxin chemicals in the urine we do it by bioenergetics we, we found, found out that they, they were, were having, having some, 
uh, toxins, some of them like heavy metals, on some of them uh, oil forces, those who live in the Niger Delta. We took them through this process, and at the end of the day, they came back to receive the same embryos that have been received, that have been stored, and they end up getting pregnant. Some of them who did not have embryos, there was increase in the oocyte yield after stimulation. And as I showed in that data, the increase was almost 10 to 20 percent in the series of 131 patients that we did. And we are still ongoing and proactively documenting this and measuring other parameters as a um, fertilization rate, which we had done before, as well as live baby. So definitely, without any doubt, they do make a, a, a complete reduction. And when we then test in some two individuals, we found that there was a reduction in those substances, in those uh, toxins. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ashiro, for your uh, uh, for sharing us with us this important information, and we can move to the next speaker now. Uh, and now I'm inviting uh, Dr. Leroy Edusain to present the next presentation about uh, authentic application of the biopsychosocial model in reproductive health care. Uh, Dr. Uh, Leroy, he's a medical, uh, medical doctor and doctor of law. He holds degrees in basic sciences, medicine, and law from universities of Ibadan, London, and Glasgow, as well as specialist qualifications in obstetrics and gynecology. He's currently professor and director in the Institute of Advanced Clinical Sciences Education, University of Medical Sciences, and Society in Nigeria. Uh, please, Dr. Liu. Thank, Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. So we're moving from something that has to do with toxins to something entirely non-toxic. Got no conflict of interest to declare. And in this short presentation, I'll be describing the biopsychosocial model of care I'll be pointing out how this is different from the traditional biomedical model. I'll draw attention to an existing guideline for providing biopsychosocial care in assisted reproduction, and then I'll be addressing the issue of authenticity. How authentic is our application of this model? Growing up as a medical student and a resident doctor, I was fed a rich diet of biomedical stuff. But as I began to mature as a person and as a clinician, I began to feel that this was an unbalanced diet. It was a bit like eating a lot of carbohydrates with no fruits and no vegetables. I began to realize that you would find a more balanced diet in the biopsychosocial model and uh, I began to champion this model thank you I began to champion this uh, model as uh, reflected in this editorial in uh, the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology BJOG but what is this model simply it's an approach that takes account not only of our patients biomedical problems but also of the pertinent psychological and social factors. Psychological factors such as their emotions, their behavior, their feelings. Social factors such as their education, social support that is available to them, and socioeconomic factors. These taken along with what we usually, what we're used to, like genetics, immune responses, and so on. This model of care differs substantially from the biomedical model 
particularly in how it conceptualizes health. So in the biomedical model, medicine is seen essentially as science. The biopsychosocial model, on the other hand, sees it as science and art, the art being just as important. The biomedical model focuses on illness. We're trying to treat diseases. In the biopsychosocial model, the emphasis is on restoring health. The biomedical model is all about disease and diagnosis, prescriptions and procedures. Whereas in the biopsychosocial model of care, there's more emphasis on healing, on well-being, on mobilizing support systems and internal resources, as well as uh, alongside uh, traditional prescriptions and operations and so on. In a nutshell, while one model is looking to cure illness, the other one is looking to care for the patient, a complete package of care, holistic care. This model of care is consonant with the World Health Organization's definition of health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease. We all recognize that physical ill health could result in psychological problems, social isolation, and economic loss, and that these in turn could lead to psychological ill health. Psychological ill health could itself predispose to or aggravate physical ill health. So there are linkages amongst all of these. Now what is remarkable is that despite recognition of these linkages, we are still stuck firmly with the biomedical model of care. And in your own particular area of practice, this is particularly important uh, because there is growing recognition of the consequences of fetal programming. And so when you take these biological factors, psychological factors, social factors, as determinants of health and the impact they have on fetal programming, you feel that those working in the field of assisted reproduction should be among the ones championing the biopsychosocial model of care. But as I have pointed out, that has not happened. And the question is why? What is holding us back from fully embracing the biopsychosocial model of care? For me, one of the main reasons is that the biomedical world, the biopsychosocial social stuff is seen as fluffy, as soft science. We are more interested in statistics and hard science. We are not drawn towards touchy-feely obstetrics or gynecology or any other aspect of medicine. But that is beginning to change because increasingly the underlying Biome uh, biological mechanisms, those mechanisms that underlie the impacts of social determinants of health are now being fully elucidated and understood. And the more we can unravel those biological mechanisms, the more likely it is that practicing clinicians traditionally brought up in the biomedical model will begin to embrace the biopsychosocial model. One development in this regard is the emergence of epigenetics. And I see epigenetics as the bridge between biology and psychosocial health. In epigenetics, you have changes in gene expression that occur without any change in the DNA sequence. So things like sleep, diets, aging, cancer, etc. These have all been shown to exert their influences on health through epigenetic changes. So something as simple as methylation, transfer of a methyl group to a cytosine could result in dramatic changes. That methyl group could be donated by uh, foods such as uh, uh, your vitamin B and other uh, vitamins. This is dramatically illustrated in the Aguti mice experiment. So you have, <coughs> excuse me, you have mouse that is 
obese, susceptible to cancer, and has a yellow coat. But when the mothers are fed with high doses of vitamin B, folic acid, and so on, they give birth to mice that are thin and have a brown skin coat. No other treatment has been given. It's just the diet that has changed. And when this is investigated further, it is found that it has to do with methylation. In other words, this is an epigenetic change. So mechanisms like that begin to show that your sleep, your diet, your stress, these could all have direct impact on your health through mechanisms that are biologically, scientifically elucidated. And once clinicians begin to see more and more of that evidence, they are more and more likely to, emphasize, to uh, accept the biopsychosocial model and see it as intrinsic to their day-to-day -day practice. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to the guideline that I've talked about. The uh, ESHRI guideline was issued in 2015. And in that guideline, a distinction is made, excuse me, <coughs> I think maybe last night's drink is affecting me more, right? <laughs> so the guideline distinguishes between uh, routine psychosocial care and infertility counseling and psychotherapy. So psychotherapy is about treating mental uh, ill health. Infertility counseling is for specific cases related to grief, reaction, and things like that. So this guideline is not about those. The guideline is about routine psychosocial care. And this is what the guideline says uh, providing routine psychosocial care uh, can achieve. Reduction in stress, reducing concerns about medical procedures, improving lifestyle outcomes, improving knowledge, improving well-being and satisfaction with care, improving compliance. Obviously, if these are all achieved by routine psychosocial care, it should be very important for our patients and for our services. I will not take you through chapter and chapter of this uh, guideline. It's available on the internet. But I'll simply say that it looks across what happens before, during, and after treatment, and it looks at cognitive, emotional, relational, and behavioral factors. It's a very detailed guideline, but there is also a, a pocket guideline. My, res my um, concern or reservation about this pocket guideline is that it's all about meeting patients' preferences. But there's a lot more to biopsychosocial bio model than just meeting the patient's preferences. That's the guideline. Now, looking at the thrust of my presentation, which is authenticity of application, it's okay to have the guideline, but what has been the impact of the, the guideline? To what extent has its application in practice been faithful to what we set out to achieve at the outset. This was examined in a paper <coughs> which you see on the screen there. And they looked, <coughs> they conducted a survey asking people about their knowledge and use of this guideline. Take note that these are people who are actually working in the field of assisted reproduction. 54.6% of them said they knew that the guideline existed. So um, nearly half were not aware of the existence of the guideline. Important though that guideline is supposed to be. And then only about 30% used it in their routine practice. And only 18.9% made any changes to their practice despite knowing about it and applying it in their practice. They made no change to their practice. Or, or most of them made no change to their practice. Only 16.3% felt that patients benefited from the guideline. Obviously, if it is not applied, it's not going to be of any benefit. Only 12.8% referred their patients to this guideline. 
even though the guideline is supposed to be about ensuring their preferences and expectations are fulfilled. But reassuringly, 80% of respondents who made changes to their practice perceived that their patients benefited from it. In other words, when the guideline is implemented the way it's supposed to be, 80% of people using, uh, using it in that way found that their patients benefited from it. So it's a case of not being applied authentically. If it were, the benefits would be realized. What were the reasons given for the uptake being so low? There were things like cost effectiveness. Obviously, if it's important to you, you're likely to find the resources for it. If it's less important, cost effectiveness is a good excuse. Not enough evidence to make strong, direct, and practical recommendations to clinical staff. So that's an important one, building the evidence base for it. Too large, needs short version. So that's another important one. It's very important in guideline development and implementation. The communication of the guideline has to be very good and effective. Uh, lack of staff expertise no real time to do the promotion. So these are some of the reasons that respondents gave why this guideline is not applied the way it should be. One reservation I have with the guideline is that it addresses psychosocial in isolation from biology. So I think if we really want to implement a biopsychosocial model, then biology has to go along with psychosocial if you have a psychosocial guideline different from your clinical guidelines, then you are dichotomizing, which is what we want to avoid. So it shouldn't just be bio on one side, psychosocial on the other side. It should be biology, psychology, and social factors coming together as illustrated on the left side of this slide. And that point is recognized in the ESHRAE guideline itself. It says to be effective and impactful, routine psychosocial care has to be provided in combination with medical care during re uh, routine practice in a way that makes it easily accessible to all patients. This implies that routine psychosocial care should be the responsibility of all staff members that have contact with patients. So when they give excuse to say it's lack of staff or lack of expertise and so on, it implies that there are people who should be specialized in that area. But here we're saying no, it has to be the responsibility of all members of the team. So for us to have authentic application, it has to move from concept to practice. The guideline has to move from a document on a shelf to practice on the shop floor. The members of the team, all members, have to be knowledgeable about it. They have to believe in it. They have to champion it. And it should be truly multidisciplinary, both in development of the guideline and in its implementation. And then patients need to know about it and buy into it. You could see from the study presented earlier that this was not brought to the attention of patients. They were not engaged in the process. All of this boils down to one thing, that there has to be stakeholder ownership of the guideline and commitment to the biopsychosocial model of care. So going forward, we have to emphasize biopsychosocial, not just psychosocial. Uh, we should be looking at adapting the ESHRAE guideline to our local environment. Very important that we should build up the evidence base for these recommendations for biopsychosocial care. In this particular case, that report showed only 36% of the 125 ESHRAE recommendations were based on high quality evidence. And as I said earlier, for us to gain clinician acceptance of the biopsychosocial model of care, we've got to have very strong evidence base for it because that's the nature of our training. Then we've got to develop educational tools for promoting this model of care. And it has to be training, 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 and more training 
because we have been brought up and we are very much steeped in it, the biomedical model of care. And to jettison that overnight is not going to happen. So it's got to be more and more training uh, for us to see, have a different conception of how we should approach our patients. And then incorporating it in accreditation and revalidation schemes would also help to drive it forward. So finally, I would like to throw a challenge to the EFSS. Thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. I would like to hope that in future conferences, the biopsychosocial model will be reflected in the program and also that EFS, EFSS can play a role in having a similar guideline for biopsychosocial care in assisted reproduction in a non-European setting. You have a major role to play and you can play that role and I'm looking forward to that role being played. So uh, I set out to describe the biopsychosocial model of care and to say how different it is from the biomedical one uh, and to draw your attention to an existing guideline for providing biopsychosocial care in assisted reproduction and addressing the issue of authenticity of application of this model and I hope that I have satisfied you in doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, for, uh, Professor uh, Liro, for your uh, presentation. Any question from the floor? Professor Strauss. Thank you very much, uh, Leroy, for this excellent presentation, I think, which is badly needed. Uh, I'm very happy that this is being presented in uh, the uh, African Federation of Fertility Society's session, uh, which was dedicated uh, the, uh, for by the organizing committee for the African Federation and Society, uh, African Federation of Fertility Societies. I, I think you know the topic you are touching is extremely important, uh, particularly in our continent, as you and I and most of us know uh, that particularly in human reproduction and fertility, is a psychosocial and medical problem. It is not only a medical problem, it is a psychosocial uh, medical problem, and indeed the psychosocial care is extremely important uh, and is badly needed. All of us know that uh, when infertility occurs, uh, even if the male is the cause of infertility, it is always the female partner who gets the, the blame and the psychological consequences uh, of uh, infertility, mm -hmm. as uh, you clearly mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you refer to the uh, ASHRAE guidelines. <coughs> these are excellent and these are very good. But what I'm calling for, uh, that's uh, the AFFS, and I think we should discuss this at the board, the poll is here as well. Uh, we should uh, call for adaptation of yes. these guidelines uh, uh, to the different countries. Uh, of uh, our continent uh, because uh, you know the perception of infertility in uh, the European countries is completely different from the perception of infertility mm -hmm. and its management and its failures but particularly those patients who fail to get pregnant they are completely different you know in these two uh, parts of the world thank you very much uh, for this ex excellent presentation thank you yeah. okay my comment on that is um, that the, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. On the other hand, we cannot adopt wholesale what applies elsewhere. So it's not a case of adoption, but a case of adaptation. You adapt what is existing to our own circumstances. And if uh, AFSS could undertake that, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much, Leroy. I, I really thank Professor Surur for uh, me, allowing me to meet you after all <laughs> these years <laughs> since you left Manchester. In fact, you covered the first, uh, the first part of my uh, uh, question because from my work with the United Nations Population Fund uh, on adaptation of, uh, of guidelines to make it usable, when, when we looked at clinical guidelines, the adoption process is, is, is a big failure because you cannot apply it for socio-economic status, for resources, etc. It's an adaptation, and my workshops 
all over the Eastern Europe was to how to adapt. So I think this is a, a, a fantastic area for collaboration, uh, multi-collaboration, and uh, I'll be more than happy to help for having uh, done the United Nations uh, adaptation program. The other point is you're looking at evidence and cost effectiveness. This has to be measurable outcomes. So what tools do you think should be used to evaluate the value for money and or the uh, uh, effectiveness of such uh, measures that are, 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 are used in biopsychosocial uh, environments. Uh, the last point is art. I may tend to disagree with you because we also have art in our practice. Medicine cannot survive without a piece of art in it. It's not all hard science. So thank you very much for your lecture. Well. Uh, thank you, Leroy, actually for that, uh, I mean, uh, mind actually storming uh, lecture, actually. My actually uh, uh, question is, uh, you just indicated two words, actually, that were striking. The first is, it's fluffy. <laughs> and this actually is a, is, a, is a problem in itself. The material we are producing or introducing actually is, as you described, is fluffy. So it, it doesn't settle down easily like actually the hard evidence. And this comes to the point, would you think actually you indicated that the guideline only 36% of the content is built on evidence. And here we're talking about the quantitative evidence. We're not talking about qualitative evidence. And this part, I think, what I, I, I need actually to have your thoughts about that, that the, the absence of uh, or the, the, mi and the minor amount of qualitative evidence is part of the uptake of this problem. People are actually are not reflecting on the qualities and most probably uh, reflections are on the quantities. And probably as well, the, the patient reported outcomes as, as, as a main outcome actually rather than the quantitative uh, like pregnancy rates and so on are another issue uh, that actually uh, if uh, propagated more actually and building more evidence on that can actually help the adaptation and the uptake of this uh, concept. Thank you. Okay, let me comment on those. Um, first of all, on the issue of uh, qualitative evidence, um, it is the case that uh, clinicians brought up in the traditional about medical model of care uh, do not traditionally, historically, have sufficient value for qualitative evidence. But that is changing. Qualitative evidence is just as good as quantitative evidence. The important thing is, was your methodology right? Is it robust methodology? Is it scientifically valid? If it is, then qualitative is just as good as quantitative. And it is in recognition of that, that nowadays, when you write an application for uh, a quantitative study, it helps if you also have a qualitative element uh, to that project. But in both cases, the emphasis is on rigor of methodology. So that's that. So yes, we want more evidence. To me, it doesn't matter whether it's qualitative or quantitative, so long as it is robust, clinically or scientifically valid. And the more um, clinicians uh, adopting the biopsychosocial model of care, the more they would even conduct quantitative studies on things like sleep, on diets, on stress, and how all this relates to clinical outcomes, biological indicators, and so on. And regarding the issue of art, uh, the biopsychosocial model doesn't say that in biomedical there's no art. No, it is a question of emphasis. Uh, medicine is art and science. When you go to the bedside and you are collecting your, um, your, your history from the patient and making your diagnosis, that is science. But your bedside manner, the way you walk, the way you approach the patient, all that is art. Okay, so we are saying that both need to be emphasized. Okay, um, and then um, 
on the issue of evidence for the efficacy of the biomedical model, the biomedical model is not an intervention. It is a concept, it's a way of approaching things. So it's not something you say, okay, let's do a study to see if this is valid. What it is is that the individual components of it, whether it is stress, whether it is sleep, whether it is diet, whether it's exercise, etc., uh, whether it is team working, each of these has various tools and approaches that can be used to validate them. So uh, um, the biopsychosocial model is something that just embraces all of that. I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Poole from South Africa. Uh, Dr. Poole, uh, he is a CEO of the Cape a Fertility. It's one of the largest private fertility clinics in South Africa. He serves as a president of South African Reproductive uh, Medicine Society for two terms and is currently the secretary of uh, general of the African Federations of Fertility Societies. Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to thank um, my good friend, um, Professor Gamal Kasurur and the organizing committee for inviting me. Um, I must say, I must congratulate you on the conference. It's been really a uh, wonderful experience being here and I've really enjoyed all the, the talks. So it's really great to be here. And I'm gonna talk now on a topic I think that's dear to many of our hearts, which is expanding ART on the African continent. So I'm from Cape Town. If you haven't been there before, this is the uh, waterfront with Table Mountain behind. And we hope that you'll come and visit us there sometime. And um, I work basically in a um, private fertility um, center in Cape Town. So let's start off with what the World Health Organization says about infertility. So it was quite a landmark decision that they made the statement that this, it's a disease of the male or female reproductive system. And every human being has a right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Individuals and couples have a right to decide the number, timing, and spacing of their children. Infertility can negate the realization of these essential human rights. This statement was very important, and it's not just a statement. It can be used and has been used to motivate governments, medical funders, and our assessment that um, fertility treatment is not just some cosmetic thing. It should be equated with other uh, medical diseases. So one of the difficult questions was how much infertility is there around the world? And it's not that easy to answer, but there is a publication um, that looked, uh, su summarized many um, of the statistics. And the first um, graph closest to me, if you look at the sort of dark pink areas, it gives you an idea where the highest incidence of primary infertility is. And you can see in Africa, there's a lot of it. Also in the, nor nor in the Middle East as well, actually. And in some northern areas of um, Russia as well. And then the second graph is secondary infertility, and that's also very high in Africa. Um, and, it, you know, there's a slight different um, sort of distribution, which is interesting. Um, so there's certain diseases which are promoting secondary infertility um, in Africa. So is infertility more common in Africa? Um, because the perception is there's like zillions of kids running around Africa, so why is everyone worried? But there is a higher incidence of infertility in Africa. And um, for the infertile woman, it, it doesn't give her any comfort that the woman next door had 10 children. Um, she's still suffering, and it's a great suffering for women in Africa. The reason for this is basically that the, the actual incidence or percentage of infertile women is high in Africa is because there's a high incidence of STIs and septic abortion which causes tubal problems, block tubes, and also uterine problems, you know, damages the uterine cavity as well. Um, the STIs in men can cause obstructive azospermia. There's also a lot of large fibroids in Africa, which contributes a lot to infertility. And we all know that fibroids are associated with infertility, and uh, tons of myomectomies are done in Africa. And this is a good and a bad thing. I guess it helps patients sometimes conceive, but there's also a lot of damage following myomectomies to the pelvis, 
and the uterine cavity. And I certainly spend a lot of my time seeing patients who've had myomectomy operations, and now we're trying to reconstruct the, the uterine cavity and so on. So the surgery for myomectomy needs a lot of reevaluation in Africa. The syndromic approach to STIs has benefit. That's where you just treat without even making a diagnosis because you might um, end up helping the patient's infertility and stopping their tubes getting damaged. But there's increased antibiotic resistance. And I see the new guidelines coming out for STIs are moving back to trying to test specific pathogens to make sure the antibiotics we're using are, are effective. Okay, so let's look at assisted reproductive technology. And we all talk about this word, but sometimes we're actually not sure what it means. So I went back to the CDC definition to make it quite clear. So ART includes all fertility treatments in which either eggs or embryos are handled, meaning this is in a laboratory, okay? So it's in an IVF laboratory. And it doesn't include fertility treatment where only sperm, like an IUI insemination is performed or prescription of medication is done, for example. So if you're just doing a semen analysis and washes and giving clomiphene citrate, that's not ART. And ART is very important because we need ART in Africa, not just clomiphene citrate or something. So why must we focus on ART? Um, the reason is because assisted reproduction is needed for many of the causes of infertility. So damaged fallopian tubes, low sperm counts, you need ICSI, advanced maternal age, you know, doing IOIs is not going to work um, in many of these patients. You need IVF, egg donation, egg freezing. Um, you need, um, there's many patients with abnormal pelvic anatomy from endometriosis and fibroid surgery and they need ART. The patients with long-standing infertility, more than three years, don't do very well with IOI. So many of these patients need IVF as well. And there are obviously patients who need egg donation and surrogacy, which is, forms part of the ART basket. So is there equitable access to IVF? Well, equal and equitable access to fertility care remains a challenge in most countries, but particularly low and middle income countries. And fertility care is really prioritized in national universal health coverage benefit packages. So we are way behind in considering what's important for, for patients. This was an ICMART publication in 2011, and um, I just want to make one point about it, was that they showed that Sub-Saharan Africa reported the lowest regional utilization of ART. Um, ANARA um, is an organization that collects ART data in Africa. It was started by Professor um, Silke Dyer and colleagues, and we've got um, Pavs here today um, from ANARA who's going to um, do a presentation on um, the data from ANARA, so I'm not going to talk too much about that, but um, I have to congratulate the ANARA team on an amazing job really collecting this data. Um, what I would like to just mention about this particular article was um, they, they collected data from 17 countries with 73 centers. This was reporting between 2013 and 2017, 153,000 cycles. The pregnancy rate was quite good, 31% clinical pregnancy rate. Um, which is, you know, very acceptable. So there is good IVF being done in Africa, and one should be quite proud of that. Um, single embryo transfer um, is still a bit of an enigma to some um, clinicians, and they still don't seem to understand that it's a good idea. But if you look at the actual data, elective single embryo transfer had a 42% pregnancy rate, which is extremely good. And if you used elective double embryo transfer, you only increased the pregnancy rate by 5%, but you made a multiple pregnancy rate of 33%. And in Africa, multiple pregnancies um, can be challenging. They may not be good neonatal care, they may rupture the uterus from previous myomectomy scar and things like that. So multiple pregnancies are even more dangerous often in Africa. In our own country, we recommend transferring one embryo up to the age of 37. And I've seen in our country a move towards this, and as people have done it, they've realized it makes no difference, and the patients get pregnant in the end, and anyway, you can cryopreserve the other embryos. So if you look at IVF procedures by country, this is kind of interesting, and there were only, obviously the reporting is not accurate. There are many countries that are not reporting all the data, but if you look at the countries that reported more than 1,000 fresh aspirations, there was four countries. Egypt um, reported actually the highest number of IVF, then Tunisia, and then South Africa and Nigeria. But if you look at the number of centers and the number of centers reporting, there's still a long way to go even in all these countries. So what about access to IVF? So from South Africa, there's SARA, which is a South African registry. 
But that's interesting. South Africa is considered like a sort of developed country compared to the rest of Africa. But when you look at the data, um, the number of patients in our population, the IVF coverage is only provided for 5% of patients needing IVF. And this is obviously often due to cost and also patients just being unaware of what to do. And if you look at where IVF is performed in South Africa, it's 85% in the private center and only 15% in the um, government centers. So it's still largely privately driven, um, but there are some very good um, government IVF centers as well. So when you look at funding of IVF, governments and healthcare funders, I spent, I promise you, I spent the last 15 years of my life butting heads with these people, trying to get them to pay. And it's always an exercise in frustration visiting uh, governments and healthcare funders. But they often make irrational and unethical decisions declining to fund IVF due to claims of it being too expensive with cosmetic treatment. We did a mathematical modeling showing them that if you did embryo transfer, they would actually save money because they didn't have to pay for all the twins in the neonatal ICUs. And these were done by health economics companies and showed clearly that they can save money. So they did kind of listen a little bit. Uh, but this is the Discovery Health building. So when I went to go and visit them, I, um, I didn't feel so sorry for them when they're in a three billion rand building and they don't have any money for our IVF uh, patients. So what they eventually, with much um, going on at them, and actually it was a lot patient driven. The patients formed their own groups and went and shouted at the Discovery Health uh, board meetings and things like this. And eventually they launched the first ART benefit. So this is the biggest medical funder in South Africa. They launched IVF funding in 2021 for certain groups of patients, which was a huge step forward. So what do we need to do to improve um, ART in Africa? Well, we need to start by having an organization that's dedicated to the voice of Africa, and it shouldn't be diluted with other international organizations because we just lose our voice if we're talking at ESHRA or ASRM or something. And you need to differentiate a data collection agency with a reproductive society. A data collection agency is anonymous and it provides data and it's very important, but a reproductive society's job is to have political clout and to change practice and also to use the data to promote that change. So that's a difference between ANARA and AFFS in terms of their roles. So the AFFS is a relatively new organization founded in 2020, and it's a federation of national fertility societies. So all the fertility societies from Africa join in, and there are currently 18 signed up African countries to AFFS. Um, it was constituted in 2020, there was a constitution um, drafted, and then there was a first general assembly where elections were um, performed for the board. And this was done by electronic voting um, systems. In fact, COVID was quite useful for us because we managed to do everything <laughs> online. These are the countries that have signed up. You can see the green on the map there, just to give you an idea who signed up. So we would still like the other countries to sign up. And some of them don't have fertility societies yet, but they form their own group and then sign up. So they're within the obstetrics and gynae group, they f form. And it's actually signing up to AFFS is starting to make countries think about fertility societies because they want to join. This is the board of directors and Professor Gamal Sarur is the president and he's been a wonderful leader for us and um, helped us to um, gain respectability and influence uh, with other organizations around the world. And these are the other honorable board members here who've also contributed a lot. So there's certain executive members and there's also region, re regional representation um, so that each area in Africa is well represented. We also have an ANARA observer on the board um, who provides data but doesn't vote. And we have a giraffe representative uh, representing the Francophone um, uh, countries. So the mission of AFFS, our aim is to improve the quality of reproductive medicine care for infertile couples and, and importantly, to improve access to high quality ART services. And um, this is important not just to waffle about IVF, but actually to um, try and make um, treatment more available to patients. So the first problem was, are patients even aware about infertility treatment? And many patients are unaware that infertility treatment is important to avoid STIs, that they uh, have to wait long for IVF treatment, that it's successful, and that it's important to see medical people that are trained specifically in ART. And AFFS and Merck Pharmaceuticals started a joint venture with patient awareness campaign to um, now make, and this is starting now, to make patients more aware of ART. But is it okay to only do a patient awareness and not provide ART services 
No, because as soon as you educate patients, they're going to say, thanks very much, no, no, I can get pregnant, where's my clinic? So you need to do it hand in hand with developing um, IVF. And the main challenges we face to, to provide IVF in Africa, one is the IVF laboratory, it's expensive infrastructure, but it's not the most difficult thing. There are many people that can fund um, IVF and uh, the commercial world often will provide this because it's a profitable ent enterprise at the end of the day. But the other thing that's important is medical staff with specialized training, gynecologists with specific, specific training, sorry, in reproductive medicine, and lab technicians with training in embryology. And this is one of our biggest challenges as well. So looking at education on the, on the um, continent is extremely important. There's a few other things as well, the legislation and legal governance. Legislation is outdated in most countries. Um, fertility procedures are often legally banned or they're restricted from care. And most of the time, this is just plain unethical um, law. Uh, but we should, as doctors, always um, try to motivate our governments to fix the law in terms of fertility treatment. And what's interesting in our own law, and in many countries' law, is the fertility law is actually the biggest section, section of many health laws because it's so complex. And doctors do need to be involved in drafting that and, uh, and talking to politicians. Gamete donation and surrogacy are often banned. Um, and correct medical legal processes and lab safety protocols are lacking in many IVF clinics. And we don't want IVF to become the wild west of Africa, basically. So it's important to share medical legal like consent forms and processes with new people starting IVF labs. Batching of IVF cycles has done a lot, of, a lot in Africa. This is because there's a lack of trained doctors and embryologists. So they travel for one place, they do a few IVFs, and then they leave again. But um, I have serious concerns with batching of IVF patients. Firstly, you have the problem of suboptimal care of frozen embryos and gametes and storage. And I've heard of ter terrible stories where no one fills the tanks and then the embryos all die or whatever inside the tanks. Um, you get poor follow-up of IVF. If the patient gets a negative result and the doctors have left, nobody sits with the patient afterwards and discusses the negative IVF result and what's going to happen next. So the patients get despondent and they just stop treatment, which is really a serious problem in IVF treatment because we know that one treatment may be inadequate. And uh, you'll get a decreased cumulative pregnancy rate due to this. So what, if, what has AFFS done? Well, I think we've established credibility as a democratically elected body, and we've linked with the other major organizations in the world. We were going to have a Fertility Africa meeting in, in Cape Town. We set the whole thing up. Everything was booked. All the delegates were on their way, and then COVID hit us. So unfortunately, that got scrapped. But instead of that, we had, um, we've had three um, webinars looking at different areas, hosted by different areas in, in Africa, and I think they were excellent webinars. Uh, we've worked with FIGO to develop the ovulatory disorders classification. And we're trying to develop um, AFFS as a platform for other organizations to work through. So we provide the professionals and the other people can provide um, money and other um, sort of support services that are necessary. So Merck and AFFS collaborated. Um, and one of the first things we're doing is expert meetings to look at improving education on the continent. The Bill Gates Foundation is interested in working with us to look at genetic issues and testing on the, uh, on the continent. And we obviously want to encourage participation in conferences and let countries know. So if there's a conference happening next door, then AFFS can advertise to the whole continent and people will start attending other people's conferences, hopefully. So just a quick uh, word, we had a, the AFFS Merck workshop, which started, re this was just literally hot off the press, was just recently, um, and we started um, interviewing online different doctors and leaders. 16 active leaders were approached from different countries, and there was a lot of participation from these countries. Um, but I'm just going to highlight two, like two points, basically. So the one question is, what is the level of experience needed to work in an IVF ART center? And you'll see that there's only a couple of countries that actually have fellowship training programs. Many countries, just a normal gynecologist that's doing ART. And this is not adequate, actually. You need to really train people properly, otherwise you're going to have very poor IVF um, services. So I think we've got a long way to go in terms of that. And if they, the other question is, are there reproductive medicine training centers? And you can see in Egypt, South Africa, and Tunisia, there are. In Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, there, were, there wasn't anything. So the, we need to look at how do we allocate reproductive medicine training. If, if there are centers of excellence in, in Africa, then people need to travel there and train. 
So what's the future for AFFS? Well, Africa is the largest future growth market for IVF in the world. And there's a lot of interest, not just in Africa, but the whole world is basically looking at Africa now. And we need to incorporate all our national fertility societies into AFFS and get all fertility centers on the continent to produce ART data. And we need participation from all role players. So thank you very much. This is a view from the cable car going up Table Mountain. And uh, I wish you all the best with the conference. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Apul, uh, for a nice and comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, one important thing for improving the quality of the work is the financial support. Uh, I, uh, we met, I think, in my country and also in Africa. Uh, one of important obstacles is the financial support, especially for private uh, patients. Uh, I would like to ask if there is a possibility to put uh, this problem of ART patient under umbrella of medical insurance because I think uh, Professor, uh, uh, our Professor uh, Gamal uh, and other colleagues, um, only few uh, governmental centers may be under this license, but the problem in private sector. Yes, thank you. I mean, it's an excellent question, and I think we've, in South Africa, we've been going through that. So, at, at, at the, up till last year, all our patients just paid out their pocket for, for IVF treatment, and, you know, it was a big fight to get the medical funders to look at it. And they were nervous. They thought it's going to cost too much money. But now that they've been involved for a year or two, they realize it's not actually um, as unaffordable as they they think, and also they're getting a lot of positive um, reinforcement. A lot of people are joining the medical aid, and they make them go to, a, to upscale their scheme or whatever. You know, they charge a little bit more of a premium, um, but the patients actually do it. So a lot of our patients now, they're looking at this medical scheme. They're saying, yeah, that actually pays. I don't have the money in my pocket now to pay for IVF. I'll go on the scheme. My premium will go up a little bit. Uh, and it's, 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 you know, the medical scheme, actually, they don't lose money. They actually get these patients on their medical scheme who wouldn't have actually been there before. And the patients stay on that scheme then. So for other health reasons, you know, they, they pay a little bit higher premium. They get access to all kinds of other health benefits as well. But I think it's, a, it's an evolution process. So one has to talk to medical insurance companies. Um, and and uh, I think governments must also come to the party as well. And they must certainly make their laws um, applicable that the health funders can't escape it so easily because even in our law IVF was excluded so we had to um, fight a lot um, with the medical funders because of that law and that law hasn't changed but we've managed to get the funders to to come on board anyway so it's it's a hard it's a quite a hard road but there's different um, ways of getting there you know and I think Africa is just behind what's happening in Europe and in America and so on because in most of those countries there are insurance schemes covering IVF Thank you so much. Please, any questions? Dr. Murak. Doctor. Thanks very much. That's very impressive. Very impressive. Congratulations. Another, another medal here. <laughs> uh, the team, of course. Uh, just a couple of thoughts, in a way. Uh, this, I mean, when you showed the country that have uh, uh, fertility societies, obviously, this is, about, uh, my estimate visually is about 40%. Have you considered uh, uh, including countries where they have sexual and reproductive health because it can be a step forward uh, rather than just hitting them straight into ART? Uh, I think this could be a step forward to include representatives from sexual reproductive health society uh, in this forum and then you promote it or you scale it up later on. Uh, the other thought is that there are a lot of expat uh, African, I'm one of them, and who are so willing to help. Have you thought of having a subdivision in the, of the expat uh, African who will work as a bridge and uh, import and export knowledge and practice in, in, in to support such an impressive project there? Regarding uh, uh, registry, you know, in the UK we had 
this registry yeah. and uh, and I, I truly believe having practice in the UK for such a long time, it has to be enforced by law. Registry as a sort of uh, keeping a book. Uh, whenever you get a phone call that I'm, uh, I'm doing this or I'm doing that, it never works. And the only we only succeeded in the UK to have really a proper registry when we had law. Uh, to control uh, assisted reproduction. So, uh, is there a scope for such a thing? It's very challenging, mm. but... Uh, I think your comments are excellent, and um, thank you so much uh, for your comments. I, mean, I agree with all your suggestions. I think AFFS is a new organization, so these wonderful ideas we will take on board. Um, you know, in terms of developing and making links with people, because we need all the help we can get. You know, it's not an easy project. Um, in terms of... Um, you know, I think the, the changing law is extremely difficult. Uh, it takes like 10 years to change parliamentary laws. So one should, shouldn't give up. One should still um, press people to do that. But I think, um, you know, perhaps can maybe talk more about, um, you know, ART um, registries and that. What we did in South Africa, it was quite interesting because when we started, we had a whole discussion about like, how do we get everyone to participate? And we used the sort of FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out um, concept of, of humanity. So what we did is we said, okay, our reproductive medicine society will list your center as a center of excellence, but there's certain things you must comply with. And we made the guidelines fairly simple to comply with. It wasn't that difficult, but one of the things was that you have to submit your ART data. So, and we just opened it up. We said, okay, whoever wants to do it is voluntary. And then a few clinics started doing it. Then all the clinics are like, I also want to be involved. Why is my clinic not listed there? And people would start coming forward. And then as soon as I did that, they had to comply with the ART um, uh, input. So there are various ways, I guess, of, of getting people to do it in a friendly way without being um, too sort of prescriptive, you know. But I think one should look at the different aspects, the legal side, and then, you know, voluntarily getting people via societies as well. Yeah, incentives, yeah. Any more questions? But, but if I comment on the point of making by law, we are in a country here, we have many laws <laughs> which is not applied at all. You are coming from a country where each law is applied. So I think... <laughs> <laughs> so... So I, I think this is the last point to be considered from the AFSC. <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Professor Sroor, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul, for this excellent presentation and for the introducing the AFFS. I just want to comment on the comment of uh, Professor Rafaf. Uh, you know, the fact that try to get coverage of, IV, uh, of IVF treatment by insurance companies, I think it would be very difficult. But I, as Paul mentioned, I think the way forward is to convince your government. It took me 10 years to convince the uh, authorities of the Al-Azhar University to introduce IVF. And eventually we, we could succeed by persistence. Uh, it happened that we have a minister who was very progressive uh, and he was very conv convinced to introduce IVF in the Ministry of Health uh, in the year 2000, even before Al-Azhar University. And uh, this is the way to do it. As Paul mentioned, if you show to the government that the cost of the complication of treatment of infertility, a particular ART in the private center, will cost the country much more money than establishing IVF service, like premature ne neonatal intensive care, uh, diseases, uh, therapies, etc., ovarian hyperstimulation, all this. This is the only way to convince the government, I think. And if we persist on this, you uh, can always achieve something. And uh, uh, Paul referred to the uh, degrees being given by uh, the various bodies here. Well, you know, this is the thing. Once you start thing, then it, it spreads around. We started this at Alaza University by establishing these training courses, and then uh, we developed the diploma, ma master degree, and the uh, PhD degree, and then other universities did the, uh, the same. You know, the Cairo University developed as well the diploma, uh, which are different from the professional diplomas which is being issued by uh, some of the private centers. And I'm sorry to say that these professional diplomas, uh, they are harmful, inadequate, and really 
they do not provide the expertise to the patient, the to the uh, infertility patient. And the only way is to have it in governmental institutes uh, so that they can be well trained and they can provide uh, evidence-based service. Thank you, sorry for being too long. Thanks, come Thank on. you very Thank much, you. Professor uh, Sarur. <laughs> your fingerprints. <coughs> yeah, uh, nobody deny uh, anything. You are struggling for a long time and fighting uh, for improving the quality uh, in every uh, uh, in every field in health, especially in ART. Thank you so much, Professor Sarur. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Now, Paul. Now we move to the uh, last speaker. Uh, last speaker is from South Africa, uh, Dr. Karen uh, Heuser. Uh, she is the head of Reproductive Biology Laboratory, studied biological science with an interest in plant physiology at the University of, of uh, Potchefstroom south of uh, Africa. She manages the ART laboratory at Steve Pico Academic Hospital University of uh, Pretoria since 1997 and also specialized in curriculum specific training of embryologist postgraduate research in assisted reproductive technology. Dr. Karen will uh, speak today about uh, evolving practice in ART resources, tools, and laboratory cost. Dr. Karen, please. Good day. Thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be in Egypt and uh, to experience your hospitality. Um, I would like to say that my title of my talk is a bit of a misnomer. Since the content was adjusted to uh, more reflect on environmental aspects, so I intended to talk about um, add-ons and artificial intelligence and then thought I'm going to take myself and you on a journey of investigation into the environment and how does this impact on assisted reproduction. So I would like to start with the first section and that's to say I have no conflict of interest. This was a journey for me and we are going to look into the art economical and how sustainable it is. It's going to be a colorful journey. And single-use plastics, and what kind of plastics do we use as a person as well as in the lab. Then epidemics and pandemics, now that this impact on us, um, the risks, and then in the human body, what is the impact of plastic? In, uh, in reproduction and the type of plastics that we use as well as the strategy what is known as a greener art lab. So if we begin with consensus and that is the term of Ubuntu, it's the common bonds that we have as a nation, as a uh, continent and also as a society. And this is we will come together to have a consensus, but then we need to have evidence for the reason to change and to address this. So this is above debate, is that is we all agree that this is the best for the community, and then we all buy into that. So this also refers to economical and environmental sustainable future. We should not have blind faith into our own cleverness. And this includes novelties and status and consumerism, which bring us about to where do we investigate our money into. Somebody uh, wrote, why do we buy things that take 200 years to degrade while we use it for 20 minutes? So I think each of us must look into what is good for us. And for example, this is the pristine landmark in South Africa. You see Table Mountain there uh, on the far left. And this is seen from Blauberg Strand. So this is um, a pristine landmark. And you will never think that a few uh, sections far away from this 
is another place which is called Kreeftebai. And this is where the pollution you can see of the um, high tide mark uh, and the plastic wastes, wastes that's there. Also what you can see is the footprints of the albatross, which is obviously opportunistic and wanted to look for food that is there. And if we look into what has happened in the Pacific, North, North Pacific, we can see the reports from the National Wildlife Federation that this is clearly a massive volume of pollution whereby this impacts on the marine life and the future. This is in South Africa, this is at Meusenberg, and you have seen this small little pearl-like plastic products. This is called nurdles. And this is the virgin type of plastic that they use to mold all type of plastics into. And the breakdown of this plastic is called nanoparticles. So microplastics and nanoplastics will then form with the increase, increase in plastics. So you can ask now, how does this impact on assisted reproduction? And we know this, the, the slogan, we have to re reduce, reuse, and recycle, but is this feasible for assisted reproduction? <clears throat> so this was the major research assignment in one of my students, and to look into single-use plastics in assisted reproduction, and to see how much plastic do we actually use. Um, so the number of plastic items per patient, the quantity, and then also what is the impact of COVID-19. And we looked to in an array of plastic disposables that we use. You can see here to the left-hand side the typical type of plastics that we use, all kinds of plastics, the clear ones and very um, sturdy ones are polycarbonate. And you can see that this is to the right hand side is this is after a uh, patient aspiration and then we identify the biohazard waste. So we started to look into how will we classify this and this is based on the number of oocytes and retrieved and the type of insemination. This was then indicated of the type of insemination and the type of procedure and it's called PPs. So the default procedure pathways followed by all patients. And this was indicated then um, at the end of the disposables um, and the weight and the per patient procedure. 13 different pathways were identified as well addi additional pathways such as frozen thought embryo transfer, IOI and diagnostic sperm tests. At the end we could calculate what is the plastic waste and what is the plastic waste footprint of us. And we could in identify that there are an average number of screening dishes, an average number of aspiration tubes per patient. So there's no change on procedural protocol and it's why we identified it accordingly. And after this, we calculated and we see that we have a total of 163, 293 grams for the year 2019. 2020, when COVID-19 happens, we have approximately 100 kilograms of plastic that we generated. And then COVID happens. And if you look at this interesting, this was striking to me, the photo. On the left-hand side is the influenza virus uh, in, in uh, 1918 and then you have 2020. Look at the difference in the attire. So the one is organic, the other one is plastic and it's disposable and it's single use because that is what is the quickest to use and the most efficient. Interesting, when I read up on, the, on what is the impact <coughs> of the um, COVID-19 on the environment and how it was managed, we see that there was a huge mismanagement and it was uh, crisis mode that the world went into with the global epidemic that happens and on a, on a global scale. And there to the right hand side you can see that in the Asian the pandemic related plastic waste generated was much higher in Singapore and Asia. And this they prescribed to PPE as well as the take, uh, take away society that occurred whereby it is online uh, purchases that happens and all this plastic and um, uh, foods that were uh, 
purchased. So if you look at the round sections, and that is the mismanagement of pandemic associated plastic, and as well as then in the River Rhine regions, as, as it is then um, dumped in the rivers, and then it flows then um, up to the oceans, and then it accumulates as is indicated. <coughs> so the interesting aspect is why did they only discover the plastics all over in the environment and in our bodies? And that the reason for it, it is very difficult to, to find the plastic in that it is everywhere. It is shocking to see that it's in fresh water, snow, ice, soil, air, and found in ocean spray even. So there's four plastic subject area specific for plastic solution, and you can see it, it's indicated nanoplastic, macroplastic, microplastic, macroplastic, and plastic pollution. And the size is different. And you can see the sizes of nanoplastic and microplastic. You can't even see this with your uh, naked eye. And then they discover that this is in our human body and in our blood. And how did they discover this? And this is by means of um, techniques that is very expensive and very specific. You can't see properly, but there are Raman spectroscopy as well as other very expensive. It's, and I say it's like looking for a needle in a haystack because the plastic looked like the microparticles. And then to see by means of elimination what kind of plastics did they discover. Um, to the right hand side is the four major plastics and uh, plastic materials. And this is the PMMA, 5%, polypropylene. Then styrene is 36%, polyethylene, 23%. And then astounding, the polyethylene tetraphylate, and phylate is a word that you don't want to hear, 50%, 2.54 microgram per milliliter in, in the mean. So one wonders the impact of the environment in the human body, where does it come from, and how does it, how will it influence us, and this, they call it the, the biogeochemical cycle. And this is the plastic in nature which occur throughout bio, mechanical and photodegradation. And then the nanoplastics are released. And this is how it impacts on our body. So microplastics can be a significant cause of male infertility. Professor Ashiru has indicated that there's lots of experimentation on animals and there's very few on humans because it's much more difficult to do all of these tests in the humans. But what I found is that it accumulates in the gonads and then it causes inflammation and reactive oxygen species and Sertoli cell death, death um, as well as dis disruption in the blood testis barrier and sperm generation. Um, so this is reproductive toxicity, if we can call it. And this is more direct evidence is however needed how it enters our body, the dose on the human tissue, and then the quality that caused, the quantity that caused the damage in the male. And what is most interesting in this article, I think any, everybody can go and read, um, this is an article in the Environmental International, and it's called Plus, Plasticenta. So this means it's plastic that was found in the placenta of, of 20 women. Uh, and I looked at the kind of plastic and what is astounding to me, if you look at number two and number 10, they could even find the color of the plastic. Um, and this was using, using Raman micro, micro uh, spectroscopy and I identified 12 pigmented microplastic fragments that ranges from five to 10 micrometers in shape, five in the fetal side and four in the maternal site and three on the amniotic membranes. And they were all polypropylene thermoplastic polymers used in cosmetics. And this means that they describe the access into the human body and how it's mediated through endocytosis and the mechanisms of paracellular uh, transport. They call dendritic cells, how it is then transported. So therefore, the I search all the websites of all the commercial companies that provide um, 
plastic to assisted reproduction units. I could find only one specific one. And this is our Vitro Life white paper and it's very good to read. And the use of plastics and equipment in IVF. And this, what they say is that there's more than 30 items which are polystyrene and used and include centrifuge and oocyte collection tubes. And the authors of opinion, if you use not an art certified type of plastic, if you have 30 contact points and it is 2% detrimental every contact point. So if you think of 30 contact point times 2%, what is the implication for every procedure that you do? And if we look at this, this is also packaging materials, tubes and dishes and seals uh, and epoxy and um, it, it is all over the place. So those are the four plastics that was found in human blood as is highlighted in this ta table. However, it is surprising to look at the articles and they look at follicular fluid, human blood as well as um, urine to look at uh, BPA, this bisphenol and phthalate. And they consumed, they, they found that consumed plastic bottle water use by art patients um, has an impact on the outcome of assisted reproduction. When I look into which commercial uh, culture media are provided in glass and which are provided in plastic, what is interesting is the two sections to the left is for equine and bovine assisted reproduction. And the, uh, in the middle is a photo of what we use uh, at uh, Steve Biko Academic Hospital. So this glass and plastic mix. So I went to read about what bisphenol are in the media and where does it come from. And I found two articles that one is Gatimel uh, to the upper side and then the bottom one is Tagola that talked about the bisphenol A and bisphenol S present in culture media. Now you know that bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor. So that is a no-no. You, you don't want it close to anything that has to do with reproduction. But what's interesting is they found B bisphenol S in culture media. And the problem is, where did this come from? And a very good article by Argaval is uh, to do with the oxidative stress and assisted reproduction. And in this article, he described what is the impact of all these endocrine disruptors on then um, oxidative stress. So if we go on, what did we do with all of this information in our laboratory? So at the end, we decided to look at each procedure and to evaluate how can we limit plastic. And this is by packaging, by means of changing certain procedures, and to look at if you, for example, can use single-use plastic disposables with and without certain packaging. And this is, for example, hair covers. We changed from total 3,000 per year to zero by means of personalized head covers, overshoes and packaging difference, and then also staff. How do you make the staff aware of the plastic that they use? For example, food containers that they microwave, disposable paper cups that they use. This is on, I took this photo on one of my staff's table. So then I told him, do you know that disposable paper cup lined with a plastic can leach 25,000 microplastic particles that you swallow. I can tell you the next week that nobody had like this plastic um, cups on their table. And so this is important to make awareness to people and that when you purchase something or when you take something or when you dispose of something, remember the impact it will have and take cognizance of the plastic footprint. Uh, and the triage is the companies, the patients, and the labs or the centers, which is stronger, and this comes to consensus. I think there needs to be also a consensus strategy towards a bigger and a better approach. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Karen, for raising another important topic about the environment and the plastic we are using every day, every moment, and we are not aware 
of the danger of this plastic. And the floor is open for any comments or discussion. Uh, Dr. Yes, me. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Karen. You touch very important uh, issues uh, affecting uh, the globe system and the ecosystem uh, all over uh, the world. Um, uh, you see, uh, there is one of important centers in my country, in Egypt. It's called High Institute of Public Health, uh, follow the Al uh, Alexandria University. Um, they are very interested about calculation of the waste products of plastic uh, and also uh, plastic food prints and also carbon dioxide food prints. And uh, the problem, uh, they thought that during lockdown of COVID-19, maybe these pollutions may be decreased a little bit. Unfortunately, they found in spite of lockdown, the problem increasing and increasing. They're trying to search about uh, some etiology or causes or something like that. They found the problem was as you mentioned in your lecture, very valuable lecture, about plastic red of uh, the waste products of plastic. Uh, and so how we can self solve this problem? We have to get rid of plastic, but the problem, the recycling of plastic, uh, I think, uh, infinity. Yani, it's all the time present. Hmm. How you can solve this problem from your researches? Well, I can tell you 10 years ago, they called the plastic against the um, different sections along the road to South African national flower. And then they banned plastic bags or you have to pay for them. Mm. And then the plastic diminished by means of commercial and people buying and just discarding it because it's easy to obtain. Um, I think awareness is very much important because what I've read is about 91% are not recycled. So I emailed all the commercial companies that provide us with media and I ask, what do you do? I see Vitro Life, I'm not associated with Vitro Life, mm -hmm. but they have a white paper, nice, that I could read. So what, um, for example, Urijo or Marcus Medical, um, what is your white paper? What are you doing to ensure as a company, because there's a triage, it's me, the person, the operator, it's the company uh, that then, uh, and then the, the whole society, also me as a person. So what was very interesting to me is that some of the companies say they are looking into packaging, that it's more biodegradable packaging, and then also how to look at more organic method to keep the solutions cool, instead of, for example, using this very toxic coolants that they package yeah. it with, but to use, for example, a certain type of sheep wool, and then to package it in that, and to look at the total different branding. So I think the more questions we ask as the consumer, and every time when you open plastic, it sort of shock you because you think, how am I going to discard this, and will this be discarded correctly? Thank you so much. Any questions? Any questions? I'm Professor Mervet. Thank Alexander. you very much for your presentation. Actually, I, I hold the microphone to express my gratitude for all of the speakers and my pleasure by attending this amazing session. It's an eye-opening session for awareness about many humanitarian and many uh, problems that are very important to recognize because recognition of a problem is the first step in finding solutions. And mm. thank you very much. Mm. Uh, thank you for commenting, Mervet. <laughs> any, any? Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Karen. <laughs> and now we can conclude the session. I would like to thank the speakers for the excellent presentations and the co-chairman and the audience. Thank you, and I think we have to start the next session immediately. <laughs>